appreciate so much the ministry of our worship team. Thank you so much. The cell phones over the years have gone through quite an evolution. I was so happy just a couple of years ago just to have a flip phone. We had a good relationship, Flipper and I did. It was simple. It was all that I needed. Finally, the day came when my wife, she had already graduated to a smartphone. And I know why they call it a smartphone now, because I have her phone. It makes me feel dumb. But these things are something else, aren't they? However, on the front covers of these, and, and by the way, you're welcome to take yours out and look at it. Do you know what every one of these things is for on there? Some of you do. I'm going to say my wife probably does. I need help here. Hannah, can you tell me what that's for? It says home. Oh, I feel so much better. They're younger than I am and they don't know either. <laughs> you guys are supposed to be the techie ones, you know. It says home. Now, I don't know if I, when I push that, it's going to zip me back home or something or what it's going to do or bring. I don't know what it means. And I have all these, you know, some of them you can kind of guess w what they mean, but not, not all of them. Um, here's one that says watch. It says if you have an Apple Watch, you can pair it, P-A-I-R, with your iPhone here. Well, that doesn't pertain to me because you can see I don't have an Apple Watch. Sometimes there's so many things in here and either we're not aware of them or else we don't utilize them. And then it's kind of like, well, you know, life goes on without them. As I was thinking about that, I think sometimes as believers, we're kind of like that also. Um, God has given to us by His grace uh, a lot of gifts and a lot of things that we have as believers that I think sometimes either we aren't aware of. Oh, it just vibrated in my hand here. Uh, I thought it shocked me for a minute. I thought maybe I did something here, but it just vibrated. Either we have something and we don't utilize it or we, we don't know we have it. And so if you don't know you have it, how in the world can you put it to use in your walk with the Lord? Warren Wiersbe um, was, uh, for many years, the voice of the Back to the Bible broadcast out of Lincoln, Nebraska. That's why I, re well, I remember it. He tells the story of how, in years past, this would be William Randolph Hearst. He was a multimillionaire. Uh, once read of an extremely valuable piece of art, and he decided he must add this to his extensive art collection. So he instructed his agent to scour the galleries of the world to find the masterpiece he was determined to purchase at any price. After many months of painstaking search, the agent reported that the, pro the piece already belonged to Mr. Hearst and had been stored in one of his warehouses of art collections for many years. He didn't even know he had it. How could he use it? And such is the segue into what we're going to be looking at to you, with you today. If you have your Bibles or your handhelds device, turn them in the, to Ephesians chapter 1. Now, for those of you that have those handheld devices, all right, they're all on silent, and there's no touching any of those little app things. All right, there's, there's no checking Facebook. There's no checking messages. There's no sending messages. It's all about the Lord, right? All right, good. We're all on the same page. All right, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read beginning in verse 15, and um, you're going to realize when I start out right at the beginning of verse 15, uh, it's going to be reflecting back on something that was already said, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment too. But just to kind of get the gist of the passage, uh, first, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1, the first chapter, verse 15. For this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He's called you the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of His mighty strength, which He exerted in Christ when He raised Him from the dead 
and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. We'll pause there. All right, now there's a lot being said right now. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to look at, first of all, what the Apostle Paul is saying. Hey, this is something to give thanks and we praise God for and commend you. And then we're going to look at these latter things. He says, here's some things that you already possess as believers, but we need to develop them, okay? So let's first of all then look at, and I've labeled this in your outline, the pump up. You know what it is, pump up, right? Get all pumped up. And uh, it's being excited about something. It's okay to be excited about the Lord. You all know that, I think, all right? So as we read what the Apostle Paul is saying, he says, for this reason, since I've heard about your faith and your love, I've not stopped giving thanks to God. And I can't help but thinking it wasn't a monotonish thanks. I'm thinking he was praising God because God was at work in their lives. He was pumped, and so he's writing to them. Now, just think about this for a minute. This church is in Ephesus. It's a large city in what would be modern-day Turkey today. Can you imagine what it would be like getting a letter from the Apostle Paul? I mean, we'd make copies of that thing today, and we'd put it in a frame, right? And we'd make it really big. In fact, it would be on our Facebook page if we did that here, Okay. If we had something from the letter from the Apostle Paul, that's how big it was. That's how important it was. And so they're pretty excited about it too. The Apostle Paul is recognizing us for two things in verses 14, 15 and 16. First of all, their faith in Christ. All right, so let's look at that. For this reason, for what reason? Their faith in Christ. Look further up ahead. We're going to look at verse 13. I didn't want to go further than that because there's some really heavy theological stuff, or if you've got a really theological mind, you can kind of read that stuff. It talks about how God has chosen them and all. We're not going to talk about that today. That's another Sunday. But beginning in verse 13, notice what he says. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. All right, so just so you all understand what this is. God has revealed to us through the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, that He has a plan of salvation. That plan of salvation is found in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so the good news that comes from God is that God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life on earth, and then He was accused of things that He really didn't do, but He was hung on a cross, and He hung there and was punished for sins that he did not commit. You know whose sins he was punished for? Mine and yours. He took the hit for you. That's the good news of the gospel. God wants to know you personally. He wants to have you close with him. But there's a problem that we all have. We were born sinners. Separated from a holy God. And so God, in his love, devised a plan. And the plan is what we call the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ came, He lived, and He died, and He resurrected, and He's alive today as our Savior. Now, it's very important as you look here at the next couple words past verse 13, what these believers did with that truth. So that was the truth. So that it was here in their heads, in their, you know, in their brains. How did they respond to it? Having believed. Don't miss that point. It is extremely crucial. It's not just enough to know the facts of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you need to believe it personally too. It's called believing in your heart. Not just that, yeah, I know Jesus came and He lived and He died and He was the Son of God and He's alive today, knowing all the facts. But never coming to a personal faith in that leaves you the 18 inches short of heaven. Remember that? D.L. Moody, famous evangelist of the 19th century. So that's the thing we all have to be aware of and make sure we don't fall into that. These people had placed their faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and they were pumped up by that. Paul was pumped up about that because the message had been received. They had believed it as true for themselves personally, not just as, yeah, that's, that's the you know, right information. We're in the information age. We get all this information, right? Well, we need to believe that information for ourselves personally. That is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's pretty excited about that, thanking God for their faith. But there was something else that he mentioned. And this is, I think, where some of us, after we come to faith in Christ, we struggle. I have not stopped giving thanks to you, God, remember for you, and remember you in my prayers. And, um, oh yeah, above that, excuse me, verse 15. 
Your faith in the Lord Jesus, I almost missed it. Your love for the saints. Love for the saints. So love for other believers. Now, this is where it gets a little bit sticky. Because um, without looking around, you can probably think of maybe somebody here or somebody that's a Christian. Kind of hard to love them, isn't it? In fact, sometimes, forget the love part, I don't even like them. How in the world do you love somebody like that? Okay, well, let's pause for a second and let's try to get the perspective. There's a couple of things that we need to understand from God's point of view regarding loving other the believers. The first one is this, is that this love becomes the trademark or the indicator, the proof that you and I are true believers. Look at what John 13, 34, and 5 says. Okay, Jesus is speaking here. And he's telling his disciples, a new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, so you must, if you need to underline that one, you must, this one's non-optional, okay, you must love one another. Why? That's a good question. Whenever you're describing, you ought to read why. Well, Jesus gives the reason why. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. See, we tend to think we're disciples of Christ based solely upon what we believe in a faith statement. And we have to understand that those who don't believe in the same state faith statement that we believe in, they don't care how much we know until they know how much we actually care for them. And so Jesus said, by this everyone will know you are my disciples by, my love, by your love that you have for them. Now, All right, let's understand the type of love we're talking about. In our culture, when we talk about love, we tend to think about the warm fuzzies, you know, the things that start percolating inside of us. Not the case. Always remember, Jesus didn't die on the cross because he had a good feeling for you, okay? He didn't have necessarily warm thoughts and feelings of you. That's not the kind of love that that sent Christ to the cross and where he voluntarily laid his life down. It's talking about a kind of love that basically proves it's real by doing something for someone. It's really an action. It's not really a feeling at all. So Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. Love one another so that others will know that in fact you are my disciples as they look at the way you do things. Now, further on, that same writer of the Gospel of John wrote some letters in the New Testament. They're 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. They're towards the back of the New Testament. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to look at a couple of verses. Here's what he says. This is the Apostle John. We know that we have passed from death to life. All right, let me explain that. When a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, you move from a a position of being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. Now, sometimes you struggle with that because when you look at yourself, you mean, before I came to Christ, I was spiritually dead? Most people believe in God or some sort of deity or they may have religious feelings, but unfortunately, the word death in the New Testament really means you're separated from God. So the fact of the matter was, anytime that you are uh, without faith in Christ, the Bible says you're separated from the Holy God. You may have religious beliefs or yearnings, whatever the case may be, but you are separated. So we, have, we know then that we have passed from this death to life, to the new life in Christ. Why? Because we love each other. That's the proof. Anyone who does not love, it indicates you're spiritually dead. That's what it's saying. Verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ felt really warm, affectionate feelings for us and decided to die for the cross from us. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the revised, reversed version, I think, or something like that. No. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Again, he did something. He demonstrated. It wasn't a warm feeling. It was basically a choice to do something. And so, even if we don't have warm fuzzies for others, we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. I'm thinking, you know what? Okay, that may be the ultimate end. How about if we back it up a little bit and let's start by just doing little things. Forget the dying for them. You know, how about if we start by going out of our way to bless somebody in their life? by meeting a need that they have, whatever that need may be. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you see somebody that has a need and you start thinking, well, I hope somebody helps them out. 
maybe that somebody is going to be you. All right, so that's the trademark of the true believer. Now, we all have that capacity as believers in Christ. But you know what? You need to work on it. 1 Thessalonians 3.12. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes about that. May the Lord make your love, what? Increase and overflow. All right? Well, how does your love increase and overflow? Well, it's, it's got to be through God. You can't generate it yourself. That's where you need God's grace. Now, for some of you, just the way you're wired, that's a little bit easier than for others of you, okay? Sometimes we understand the left brain, right brain. You know, the left brain is so logical. And so we look at those who've made poor choices in life and we think, how stupid of them. You know, they just should reap what they sowed. And then you have those others who are a little bit more compassionate and you tend to think rightly, if it wasn't for the grace of God, that could be me. If it wasn't for the good family that, and parents that God gave me or the good heritage, I, that could be me. I have been blessed with things that are beyond my control that ultimately were in God's control. And because of that, God, I have been a beneficiary of that. I have benefited from those blessings. So then we need to learn on how to practice that. Let your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. Wow. Um, as you well know, every week I've got like a song quote I want to share with you. Um, the group King and Country, one of my favorites, uh, The Proof of Your Love. And as I'm going throughout the week, these are the kinds of things that are resonating in my mind. It, helped me, it helps me to get my thoughts more vertical and horizontal. Okay, here's the, um, the song, The Proof of Your Love by King and Country. Uh, the chorus part goes like this. So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Let my love look like you and what you're made of, how you lived, how you died. Love is sacrifice. So let my life be the proof the proof of your love. Let me ask you this. Does your life indicate anything at all about the proof and the reality of Jesus in your life? Do you have any of that love that indicates in some way, shape, or form it proves that you are a follower of Jesus? That's a tough question to ask, but we need to ask it and answer it. And if so, way to go. If not, God help me. All right. So moving on. Okay, so... Uh, pumping them up, faith in Christ, love for the believers. Oh, God, help us too. But here's some possessions that we all have. I'm going to look at three of them here this morning. We have these, these possessions, these blessings from God, and we need to learn how to exercise them and practice them. There are three of them. Let's look at the first one, verse 17. Let me read it, and then I'll give it to you. Okay, here's what Paul is praying. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. All right, here's the first thing that you possess, but you need to practice it. It's spiritual understanding. Now, for what reason do we need to have spiritual understanding? Again, so it's that we may know him better. Did you know that um, to uh, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord is something that should be increasing over our lives? Believe me, God is big enough and He is uh, intricate enough and, uh, and, and complex enough that our lives are like, and our minds really can't wrap our, uh, we really can't wrap our minds completely around Him. That's how big He is. And as a matter of fact, the way that He works is so oftentimes different than the, what we would do. We need to try to get to know Him a little bit better so that we can understand what He's actually trying to do. All right, Colossians 1.10, notice what it says. The Apostle Paul is praying for these people so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in everywhere, every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. So why do you need to increase in your knowledge of God? I want to talk about that for a second. One of the best books I ever read about who God is is a book that's entitled The Knowledge of the Holy written by a, a, an author from a previous generation, A.W. Tozer. He's, this guy has written a lot of books. This is one of the best ones that he has ever written. His first chapter in this book is entitled, Why We Must Think Rightly About God. 
And in the second paragraph, he says this. He asks the question, so what comes into your mind when you think about God? He goes on to say, I believe that what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. He says, there is no religion that has ever been greater than its idea or understanding of who God is. For this reason, the gravest question before the church today, and it always is, is about God Himself. And the most important fact about any person is not where he is at at any given time, what he may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward what our mental understanding or image of who God is. It's not only true of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God, just as her most significant message is what she says about God or doesn't say about God. Have you ever thought about that? Do you ever thought, think that your life, the way you behave, what you do, oftentimes is going to be dictated by who you believe God really is? Let me give you an example. Let's say that you do believe there is a God, capital G, uh, but for some reason, that God is kind of out of touch with you. He doesn't really know you or care about you. And as a matter of fact, He doesn't even know who you are and what you're doing. And so you go about and you live your life and you do anything you want just to please yourself. And you end up sometimes making some bad choices about life because you think God doesn't even care. Now, on the other hand, if you are like hopefully most of us here this morning, we do understand that you were created by God in His image. In other words, you have certain capacities to be able to relate to a true and living God. He made you for a relationship with Him. And since He is God, He knows every thought that you've ever had, which is a scary thought when you think about it. He knows everything that you've ever done. Um, he knows everything there is about you. And He knows all of your strengths and He knows all of your weaknesses and yet He loves you in spite of all that? You realize when you start thinking about God rightly how that impacts the way you're going to live your life? Because you begin to say, okay, I'm going to do this, and then you begin to have this conversation with yourself. Is, is this what God would have me to do? And that's how we live our lives. I'm not talking about brushing our teeth or getting up in the morning. I'm talking about, you know, okay, I need to make some choices here. What would be the right thing to do here? Is God interested in the details of your life? You bet He is. As a believer in Jesus Christ, God gave up His only Son to redeem you to Himself, to buy you back from your sin to Him. That's how much you are, that's how much you are worth to Him. And so we need to begin to think about who God is rightly, and that is a, a lifelong vocation. He is the God of the universe that created everything and put it all into motion and at the same time He created you. He cares for you. He made you in His image and He wants to walk you to walk closely with Him so that He can guide your life and direct you. So a person's behavior, their life, really does reveal what they really believe about God. So he asks, and he says, you know what, I, I want you to be able to grow and to have this spiritual understanding so that you may know him better. And I would say, and better, and better, and better. Hopefully as we look back over the years in our life, we, we know him a little bit better today than we did a few years back. And we know how he works in our lives today than we did a few years back. And hopefully since we're knowing Him a little bit better and finding out really what He's like, we're a little bit closer to Him, a little more consistent with Him now than we were some years back. And, and by the way, it doesn't really matter where you're at in that continuum. It just matters, are you making progress? And I know progress sometimes is two steps forward, one step back. That's normal. Getting to know Him and walking with Him. Oh, made some strides and just seemed like I got tripped up here. Okay, that's right. Get up. Go on. Go on and get to know Him better because He's a great God. So, spiritual understanding. But there's a second thing 
that we have and that we need to develop. Verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Okay, we're talking about now spiritual eyes. Enlightened eyes. For what purpose? I pray that it's, uh, your eyes, the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may, what? Know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance. For what purpose? Why should we have enlightened eyes so that we have hope? So that we're not downcast. We live in a world in which there's a lot of disappointments, a lot of tragedies. And if, in fact, we believe that God is who he is, we need to understand that even in the midst of the tragedies, he's still at work so that we can see him. You know, sometimes it's hard to see Jesus. You ever realize that? Um, take a look up there. Do you see, the, you see Jesus in that? Just focus at it for a while. Have you seen these before? I mean, I've, I've looked at that sometimes, and I thought, what? When I, very first time I saw this a number of years ago, I thought, what is that? And I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and then all of a sudden, boom, I, I saw Jesus. You know, sometimes our circumstances are kind of like this. It's kind of hard to see Jesus in it, isn't it? If you don't see him yet, keep looking. <laughs> Some of you haven't seen it yet. Trust me. Trust me. He's there, okay? You can Google this at home, too. And you, I, I noticed earlier, it seems like in some slides, it just jumped out at me. You know, those ones, it was kind of hard to see. Isn't it interesting how Jesus can be right there and we don't even see him? Take an example here. Um, the Jewish people in Deuteronomy chapter 29. You, you know... <laughs> And again, we're, we're amazed, and I'm going to tell you the reason why they do this, but uh, in, in the history of the Jewish people, how you remember when God led them out of bondage in Egypt, and he was using Moses to lead them, you know, through the desert, and God was doing all these great things, you know, there was this, the, uh, you know, pillar of fire, and then there was this cloud, and God's presence was everywhere. I mean, the Egyptians were going to come from behind him and overtake him, and, and so what does God do? He opens the Red Sea. All the nation of Israel goes across on dry land. And then when the uh, Egyptian soldiers come, you know, the, the river goes back, they all die. And can you imagine just seeing something like that? That in the midst of what could have been a disaster, God just shows up and in a miraculous way does something. And if you know the rest of the story, <laughs> the children of Israel had to wait 70 years to get to the promised land because they didn't see God at work in their midst. And so listen, I think I'll have it on the screen, what uh, Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 29. Moses summed, summoned all the Israelites and said to them, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord did in Egypt to Pharaoh, you know, the plagues, to all his officials and to all of his land. With your own eyes you saw those great trials, those signs and all those great wonders. But to this day the Lord has not given you a mind that understands or eyes that see or ears that hear. Isn't that interesting? Your eyes have seen, but you don't see. You realize there's a lot of Christians like that? You have eyes that see, but you don't really see. And so we need to have eyes that understand and can see Christ in the middle of situations. It's easy to miss, and so we have to pray, Lord, Give me eyes that are enlightened so that I will trust and so that I will understand. Remember in the uh, Gospel of Luke, this was the day after Jesus had uh, been resurrected, there were some disciples who left Jerusalem and were on their way back home to a town or a village called Emmaus. These two were not one of the original 12, but they were followers and believers of Jesus. And so they're heading back home after being at the Passover at in Jerusalem. They're heading back to Emmaus. They're having, uh, and the road to Emmaus, they're having this conversation, and unbeknownst to them, this man comes up alongside them, joins them in their walk back home. And it was Jesus. They didn't realize at the time. So Jesus, he's being kind of coy, and he goes, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they say, well, where have you been? Haven't you heard everything that's going on? You know, there was this man named Jesus who was a great prophet 
And we were hoping He was the one that was going to redeem us from oppression from Israel. And unfortunately, the Jewish leaders had Him crucified and they buried Him. But some of His followers went to the grave and they didn't find Him in the grave anymore. And they came back and said, He's alive. And Jesus looked at Him and said, Oh, you slow and foolish. And it says there in Luke chapter 24 that starting with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them everything that the Scriptures had to say about Him, that is the Messiah, who had to suffer. Even at that point, with Jesus being next to him, them, and Him explaining it, they still didn't see who He really was. It wasn't until they got to, to their destination and He was together with them uh, and uh, He decided to reenact that Last Supper. And it said the moment that He sat down and He broke the bread... It says their eyes were opened and they saw Jesus. The point I'm trying to make here is that sometimes Jesus, not only is He with you, but He is in you by virtue of His Holy Spirit. He's right there and we don't really see Him. Because we don't understand that you know, sometimes through difficult circumstances, He wants to, us to really lean hard into Him and to trust Him in that and we need to have spiritual eyes just to simply trust Him even in the midst of difficult times. Having spiritual eyes, eyes that can see Jesus no matter what the circumstances may be. All right, so eyes that have been enlightened, they're lightened up, okay? Um, all right, uh, let's see. The virtues are, Okay, the last one here, verse 19. And you may know, see it goes with verse 18, that you may know His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of His mighty strength which He exerted in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. Let me ask you this, how much power does it take to raise someone from the dead? It's more power than what I got. It's more power than anywhere that I could ever... You know, anyone that I can even think to turn to. It's that kind of power that God has given to us who believe. But God wants us to use that spiritual power. Now, we tend, you know, when you think of power, what do we think about? We tend to think of great forces at work. Or we, we tend by either by what we see visually or what we experience in life. Um, went down to the river on Thursday night. And uh, I always like the last, like, you know, 45 seconds of the fireworks show because it's just an awesome demonstration of the explosive power of fireworks, and it's just boom, boom. My eyes can't drink it all in. And have you ever noticed if you tried to video with that, it's not the same thing? It's kind of like, ah, it loses some of its boom, boom, you know, when you watch it on a screen. Not that much power there. We tend to think sometimes that's what spiritual power really is like. It's not necessarily like that. It's not necessarily a wow effect. It can be. But we have to come to the understanding that sometimes God's power isn't necessarily a, a kind of a fireworks display that's going on that we can see. Well, so then what is it? Well, let's start with the Gospel. Romans 1.16. Notice what it says. Paul says this, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. All right, let's start with a powerful message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. When a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, God's power is going to begin to be unleashed in his life. It began at the moment they came to faith in Jesus Christ, and it began to change their lives. And so perhaps no greater what testimony or indicator or evidence of God's power can be said than for a life that has changed where God through His power, through the power of the Gospel, takes an individual and causes him to turn from being an inward, sinful, sinful individual to one whose life is now radically different. Following after Christ. And so it's the power of the Gospel which is able to change lives. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, If anyone is in Christ, that's become a Christian, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. We have a life-changing experience going on in our life, continually changing. The old things are passing away, the new things are coming. So where in the world is the source of God's power in our life? It's the Holy Spirit in us. Remember when, the, when Jesus was with His disciples 
and he told them that uh, some great things were going to happen to them. Okay? He said, you know what? The Holy Spirit has come. He's going to change you. All right, Acts 1.8, you receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes. Sometimes we rely too much on ourselves, don't we? We don't realize that God's power resides in us by virtue of His Holy Spirit. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians 5.18 that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit's power. It says, be filled with the Spirit and under His power. Let me give you an example of when I first experienced that. When I first came to, the, to faith in Christ at the age of 19, uh, this was completely new to me. I grew up, did, never went to church. Uh, I had no aspirations of going into the ministry and doing what I'm doing now at all. Okay? Um, but I had a friend of mine that shared the gospel with me. And as I started to kind of investigate, here's what happened to me. I came in my mind to the uh, end, that uh, conclusion that the gospel, in fact, was true. Then there were a number of days later, I began to say, you know what, not only is it true, but it needs to be true for me. And so I trusted Christ as my Savior. And some changes began to take place. I had some new desires in my life uh, that I never had before. And some things that I used to be involved in, uh, I started to have this wrong feeling in front of God about. That was the change that was starting to take place. And then God, through his power, through some friends of mine that were friends of mine when we were going to college, and these guys were kind of, I would say they're corrupt. Yeah, they, these guys were pretty bad. In fact, they were worse than I was. And you know what happened? Some of these guys came to faith in Christ. Here's how it happened. This one guy I was in class with, we sat together, it was in a business class. After class, he's up talking to the professor. This professor, his name is Dr. Steinhauser. I didn't know who he was. It ends up, this guy is the campus director for Campus Crusade for Christ. And my friend is talking with him about the Lord. I'm looking at this conversation that's going on, and I'm just, what is this? I had been a believer for maybe six months at the time. And um, afterwards, I said to my friend, I said, hey, Tom, what, what was that all about? He said, I don't know, Barry, you've got to come over tonight. Dr. Steinhauser has come over to our apartment. He's going to talk to us about the Lord. And uh, unbeknownst to me, some of these guys in this apartment, corrupt guys, had come to faith in Christ. And their lives were being changed. And you know what that did to me? I thought, wow, if God can change those guys' corrupt lives, he must be pretty powerful. And that was such an encouragement to me in my life. Now, you may be sitting here this morning and you would, you're saying, you know, I, I'm not really corrupt. All right, well, let's boil it down to the basics. Okay, maybe you're not, you know, Mr. or Miss Corrupt, but quite honestly, you're a sinner. And you were born that way. And, and you know there's nothing good enough of yourselves that you can offer up to God in order to what? Appease Him or to make yourself acceptable to Him? You can't. The only way to make yourself acceptable to Him and to become His child is through faith in what Jesus did for you on the cross. So that's the way we have to experience God's power in our life by simply believing and trusting in Him. And then going forward from that, you know, again, just the short story here, I never had any yearnings. In fact, I remember one time when someone told me, I said, you ought to go into the ministry. I laughed at him. Then about six months later, I was checking out Bible colleges. God's power at work in my life. People praying for me. And so today, we move forward believing that God's power is at work in, his, in our lives. And the Apostle Paul in Colossians 1.29, let's go ahead and put that one up. He said, you know what? I, I move forward and serve the Lord by God's power. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy that Christ provides for me so that I can in a powerful way move forward for Christ. That same power that is operating that Paul is talking about, that the Apostle John talks about, really is available for you too. And it will be done through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life where you basically, and I'll boil it down to this, it's a control issue, where you yield yourself, you yield control of your life over to Him, and then when you do that in every area of, of your life, watch His power start to take control of your life. 
It may be small, but it'll be incremental. It won't be a fireworks display at the end. But you know what? God's power starts to make some changes in your life. And then you take a step back and you think, whoa, that one didn't come from me. God's at work in my life. And then we are to be praying for others too, that God's power would be at work in their lives. So spiritual understanding, spiritual eyes, and spiritual power. How you doing? Hopefully here as we wrap this up, and, and this is our application point, I want us to consider this. Yourself personally, put it this way. With God's help, I need to, and then you fill in the blank. With God's help, I need to, and then that's the need to is whatever you sense God has kind of tapped you on the shoulder as we've read these scriptures and if you heard the words that I've said. Whatever he has tapped you on the shoulders about, that's probably the part that you need help to do. Now, I'm going to guess that perhaps some of that would be things that, you know what, I've talked to God about that before, and I have failed that area so many times, and you're just flat out, you've given up. Always remember this, God never gives up on you. He never gives up on you, so don't you give up on him either. But you give yourself over to him, and you yield control over to Him, and you understand that if you blow it, that what is God like? Our God is a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. When we come to Him for the umpteenth time with that failure, He doesn't say, uh-oh, sorry, you're over the limit. Nope. No limit. And so we keep coming back to Him, and so we say, God, with Your help, I need to. With Your help, the emphasis, Lord, is with your help. And then by his grace. Remember that song? It's his grace. Your grace finds me. That's how we do it. So as we bow our heads, and as we look, each of us, to the Lord, to a God who knows your very thoughts, who knows you, all your actions, and who loves you and is merciful towards you in spite of all the times you've blown it, he wants to hear from you now. And so, with God's help, will you tell him what you need help doing as we close this time off? Dear God, we thank you for being like who you are. Your mercies are new every morning. Your faithfulness is without end. Your patience towards us never ceases. Your love is without limit. You are the God of the universe and at the same time personally interested in us as evidenced by sending your Son, the Lord Jesus. And now, Lord, I pray that you would take these conversations, these brief conversations from those that are here this morning, and by your grace that, Lord, you would pour before them and into their lives so that, Lord, they might be able to do whatever it is you're calling them to do, so that, Lord, it will be an indication that we truly are your followers. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or even imagine, according to his power that's at work in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.